all yours. Yes, sir. Well, uh, thank you for having me, man. Um, we were just saying off air, it's such a beautiful thing that, that you guys have built. And thanks for having me a part of it. Um, and it's needed. Um, so I got a couple things I wanted to work on today, but I think I'm going to start by just playing a little bit. I always find in these situations, and I haven't played today, so this would be a nice little warm up. Um, I just want to play a little bit, then I'm going to talk about just my journey, how I got to music, how I got to the space that I'm in now, and then jump into some of the exercises that I had in mind. But then more importantly, in these situations, it's important for you guys to have questions. Um, you know, I can talk about what I've worked on and things I'm working on now, but I want you all to walk away with, you know, some insight on what you guys are working on. So think of some questions so I can, you know, touch on things that you guys are actually working on. Um, cool. Let me play a little bit. We'll talk about m more what I'm about to do because it's a part of the exercise, but I just want to start out by just playing a little bit. Sorry, I, not to interrupt, but when you play next time, maybe if you turn away from the computer a little bit, because it, it, it was a little distorted. Okay, turn more. All thanks. right. Yeah, gotcha. thanks, man. Thank you. And also lower the uh, input volume too, and that'll help in our right. audio settings. Let me try that real quick. Yeah, see, Camilo's a trumpet player, he knows the tricks. <laughs> you said lower the uh input oh i see yep see if that'll help cool thank you for that so that was just a free excerpt that i played right we'll talk about that a little bit later and get into some exercise around that i just want to kind of talk about you know my journey and how i got to music and you know my direction, my kind of my concept. Um, I always tell, you know, people I'm fortunate enough to be raised. I was raised in a, in a household where my mom played great music, like 24 hours a day, damn near. Even when we're asleep, she had records on in the background. So literally all day. So I was, you know, I was raised listening to Barry White, you know, all the soul music from the 60s and the 70s, uh, gospel music. Um, I actually wasn't introduced into jazz until fourth grade. I joined the elementary school band in fourth grade, uh, started on drums, switched to the, the trumpet in fifth grade. And that's when my band director, I always shout out Diane Ellis. Every master class, every chance I get, I shout out my fifth grade elementary band director, Diane Ellis, for giving me my first jazz record, right? She gave me my first record. I'll never forget, it was Lee Morgan's Candy. What's that, 1953, Lee Morgan Candy, incredible record. I, I can envision my, my fifth grade self walking home, putting this record in, listening to this record, and my mind was blown by the sound that Lee Morgan produced on the trumpet. You know, it, was, it was very vocal-like, <clears throat> and to this day, I'm still attracted to musicians who play with that vocal-like quality, right? So 
you know, raised in a household, great music around me, joined the band early fourth, fifth grade, you know, fell in love with this music and the sound of this music very early, um, which is why I always emphasize it's so important that we expose our children to this great music. Um, so fast forward a little bit, you know, I, I, I played band sixth, seventh, eighth grade, graduating, I get to high school, I start to get a little more serious. I, I start to realize that, oh, I can go to college, you know, playing my instrument. I can actually make money playing my instrument. So at that time, I want to say maybe my sophomore year, I actually quit all of the sports teams I was on. I played football and baseball and basketball. I quit those and I, you know, I got in the woodshed, as we say, um, you know, kind of fast forward a little bit, graduated. I went to Northern Illinois University. Um, and I got my undergraduate degree in music education. I always thank my mentors. They instilled in me the importance of education. Uh, it's not just about being able to play. It's about being able to explain and pass down the things that you're playing. That's a part of this culture and a part of this music, right? So I got my undergraduate degree in education knowing that, oh, I'm going to teach one day. I'm going to. So I was thinking way ahead, like knowing that education and teaching and passing this knowledge down is important to me, right? <clears throat> Fast forward, I get my graduate uh, degree in jazz pedagogy, which is also the form of teaching, art form, how to teach. Uh, again, doing all this very strategic, knowing that one day I want to put these degrees to, to use. I want to be able to teach and, and educate, you know, the values of this music. Um, fast forward a little bit, I graduated grad school 2012. I was already active on the Chicago jazz scene. I put on my first project 2012. Um, then I moved to New York 20, 2014. And, and really that's when things really started to take off. Not to say that they were not before, but I, I found myself in different circles and rubbing elbows with you know, just musicians on another level. Um, continue to put out projects. I remember challenging myself. I told myself every year, starting in the year 2014, I'm gonna put out a a project every single year. And that was a personal challenge for myself. So that required me writing music, that required me shedding piano, studying different cultures and music that I like so that it can be influenced in my music, right? So that was a personal challenge for me. Uh, continuing to fast forward, I've been living in New York since 2014 and, you know, having the opportunity to tour the world and play my music and also tour with different side men. Um, and I always just tell this story because this music is so powerful. I'm a, you know, a black boy from the south side of Chicago. I've been able to travel all around the world through this music. So it's, it's, it's very powerful. Um, cool. Now I want to actually jump into some of the lessons that I, I had in mind for today. Um, one thing that I constantly find myself working on today, I, I, I look back and I see my younger self also working on these things. But even today as an instrumentalist, as a soloist, I want to sound more lyrical on my instrument, just period. I want to sound like a human voice, right? When I'm improvising, when I stand up on stage to the microphone and people are listening to me and feeling my energy, I want to sound like I'm singing to them, right? And in my practice, I do certain things to help me, you know, accomplish that, to help me work towards that goal, right? And I want to do some of that today with you all. Now, jumping back to that very first exercise I did to open up the master class, I played a completely, just a free, a free melody, if you will, a free excerpt. Um, and I use this word free and students, they always, they run, run away from this, this word, free jazz or free music or avant-garde, like there's beauty in that music as well, right? So what I want us to do now, <clears throat> It's pretty much do exactly what I did. And in, in doing this, I completely free my mind. First, let me rewind a little bit. I typically do this at the very end of my practice session. So I'll warm up, you know, trumpet players, we got a buzz, we have to do our lip slurs, you know, our articulation, our Arvin's book. If I'm working on the tune or transcription, I'll, I'll, I'll do all of those things. At the very end of my practice, this is what I'll do. I'll sit completely free my mind and just play melodies and shapes that come to me, right? I'm not thinking of rhythm. I'm not thinking of pitch. I'm not thinking of key center. I'm trying my best not to think of anything. 
and I'm putting myself in this space where I'm just going to play free melodies, right? Check it out. Again, with the intention in mind of playing melodic. That's the, that's the word. We're trying to play more melodic, right? number one then I'll sit rest for 30 seconds and do a completely different excerpt right sit rest for 30 seconds do a completely different excerpt right it's endless right <clears throat> and a, another very cool thing about this we all have one of these a cell phone I put on my voice memo and I record myself every time I do this and I write and compose music based on these free excerpts that I play that's probably how I write 40% of my music you know, playing melodies that come to my mind, recording them, sitting at the piano, catching a vibe of one of the melodies that stuck out to me and start to build from there, right? So you're, you're killing two or three birds at one stone. You're working on your sound. You're working on playing more melodic and more free and more shapes and colors. And you're also working on composition. So I, I encourage everyone, even my older students, my younger students, everyone, incorporate this into your practice it only only helps you right let me do another excerpt and while i'm doing this i want you all to start pulling your horns out so we can go around and start experimenting i want to hear some of you all again um right so here's the second one right <clears throat> again completely free in my mind only thing on my mind is melody i want to play melodic right <clears throat> number two so it really is as simple <clears throat> as that right the most difficult part to me is being able to clear your mind right and i also look at this as a form of meditation to be honest right when you're sitting still in silence trying to clear your mind and play melody that's definitely meditate right um let's start there i want to start there i want to hear some of you all taking this concept and expressing it through your voice. So who wants to who wants to play first? Who we got? Let me see. I'll go. My man. Right? So you imagine this is the end of your practice, right? You're you're not thinking about anything, right? You're you're trying to be completely clear. You're trying to just play shapes and colors, melodies that come to your mind. All right. Take it away. Thank you. 
Absolutely beautiful. Quick note, Darren, uh, Darren sent a, a note telling everyone to go into uh, audio settings and do what I did and turn that input volume down a little bit. Yeah, uh, me and uh, Camilla, we was having, well, we was practicing together and had the same issue, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have the uh, the settings on here, so I can't really uh, do no anything. I heard, I heard most of that maybe turn to the side a little bit more, but either way, okay. exactly what you just did, beautiful. And the beautiful thing about this, there is no wrong, there is no right. This is us just playing, right? I want you to take 10 seconds and I want you to do the exact same thing. But this time I want to add imagery, add imagery to this exercise now. And again, the beautiful thing about this exercise, you can take it and you make it yours, right? Mm -hmm. All right, check this out. <clears throat> I'm gonna do, do the exact same concept. I'm playing free, but this time I'm putting myself in the space where I can only play in the key of D major, right? This does multiple things. It, again, it works on our sound, it works on our melody ideas and kind of building melody, but now we're adding ourselves and putting ourselves in this box of we can only play in the key of D major. Now this is making us, forcing us to work on certain keys, right? clear i'm playing shapes and melodies i'm composing in real time spontaneous composition but now we're putting ourselves in this box of only playing in the key of d major right i've seen right. how this changes what you play right mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Ideally, you would have recorded both of those two excerpts you, you, you played, right? Let them sit in your phone for a couple of weeks or whatever. Come back, listen to them, sit down at the piano, take excerpts that you like, and you start to compose tunes off of that, right? Really, really good. Um, who else wants to play with us? Let's get uh, someone else up here. Great job, Jordan. I'll give, I'll give it a shot. I got you. All right. Who are we talking to? Let me see. Me. Cam. There we go. All right. Cool. Hey, I got me on the big screen now, Lord. <laughs> right? So the exact same concept, man. We're take away the key of D major. Right now, this is the end of your practice. You're just completely free. Your your mind is free. You're playing shapes and melodies that come to you. Okay. Yeah. Let me turn this down. things that came to mind uh listening think more like a vocalist right we're trumpet players you're playing trumpet shapes right uh you're starting to get towards your territory of the things that like you know you know we all do that we all have things that we know this is an exercise where we're truly improvising like get to that space where you're improvising you're playing shapes and ideas that you don't, you know, lean on your licks and your things like that, right? We're truly just playing free shapes and colors that come to our mind, right? And there's a challenge in that. It really is. But there's so much beauty in it, especially when we're recording ourselves and we start to compose around these things, right? Let me try one. Beautiful, beautiful. And again, I'm thinking like a vocalist, right? singing the trumpet the the flute horn this is just an extension of my voice i'm trying to sing through my heart right <laughs> Thank you. 
Woo. Beautiful, man. Nah, you should have recorded that. If you would have recorded that, you've got you've got a couple melodies and tunes in there. Absolutely beautiful. Um, beautiful. Um, let's get someone else up here. Let's get let's get one more than one more person. Then I want to move to the the next concept that's related to this. Um, who else wants to play? I can probably go. Yeah, you can. No problem. You got it. Yes, sir. Cool, right? Um, you've been listening. The exact same concept. This is the end of your practice, right? You've already played all the notes. You've you've worked on the scales. You've worked on all of those things. Now your mind is free. You're just playing whatever comes out of you, shapes and melodies, right? Take it away. sound right Ooh, take 10 seconds and we'll do it again <clears throat> but this time i want to i call them mental boxes i'm going to put you in a mental box right mm -hmm. and the mental box is really in this context is giving you a concept to work on it's giving you a limitation which forces you to work on something i just mm -hmm. like to refer to them as mental boxes right so i'm going to put you in the mental box of only playing ascending lines right it's the same concept. We're, we're trying to sing through our instruments. We're playing melodies and shapes, mind completely free. But now I'm giving you the limitation of all of your phrases must ascend. You can't descend. Um, every, every phrase just must be an ascending phrase, right? Now I want you to notice how this, it causes you to think differently and to play different shapes. Mm -hmm. and so check it out, right? Same concept, but now your phrase must be ascending. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. Oof, all right, here we go. <laughs> that nicely when i put a lot of students in that mental box they tend tend to tense up but it's as simple as that it's 
you know, you're free and you're playing ascending phrases, right? Another mental boss could be only descending phrases, right? Descending mm-hmm. phrases. Another mental boss could be uh, only the interval of a fourth. You get, you guys get where I'm going. It's you take the concept, then you make it your own. Whatever you're working on at the moment, right? Say you want to, you know, in jazz band, I want to work on playing more jazz eighth notes, like eighth notes, swinging eighth notes. Okay. I'll sit and clear my mind and tell myself, okay, I'm going to play a free excerpt where I'm forcing myself to play continuous eighth notes, right? Same concept, same mental box, same melodic phrasing, but I'm forcing myself to play eighth notes, right? yourself in these situations where you have to fight your way out of it right and that's the whole purpose of this exercise or this mental box right continuous eighth notes making yourself find resolution notes right another mental box could be you know it it really is limitless right um cool beautiful beautiful let's get someone else up let's get one more person up and now I'm going to switch the concept just a little bit, right? Keeping this theme of melodic playing, right? I said at the beginning of this, this master class, most of my face, my, my, my favorite players, they play like vocalists, right? They, they, they sing the, through their instruments. Roy Hargrove, rest in peace. Uh, Dexter, Dexter Gordon, um, uh, Vincent Gardner's coming to mind right now. Great trombonist in the Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra. Um, of course, Bird, you know, all, all the greats, all the masters that we love, they have that that's that vocal like quality, right? So I took this concept and I, I started to incorporate it with my younger students, but now I use it daily, right? Uh give me give me a, a volunteer. Who, who's up next? Okay. Great, right? So I want you to think of your favorite or one of your favorite quotes, or one of your favorite lyrics, one of your favorite lines from a poem, and, and just recite it to me. Oh. Whatever comes to mind. Uh, okay. What well, speak speak it to me first? The actual words. Oh, um, I was just gonna do a a, a ballad. Uh, well, what are the words? What's the line? The actual. My sweet embrace, hobo you. Okay. Um, my sweet embraceable you. That's so we'll, for the, the the context of this exercise. That's the lyric we're dealing with. My sweet embraceable you, right? Just say that. My sweet embraceable you. 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 My sweet embraceable. Thank you. 
right? So the concept of this isn't to find a jazz standard or it's, it's to find a lyric or a, a, a poem or a vocal passage that you like and, and play that passage on your instrument, right? So I just play my sweet embraceable you 12 different ways, right? Try that, my sweet embraceable you, right? Again, you don't have to stick to a key, you're completely free. You're playing melodies based off of this lyric that you like, my sweet embraceable you. Let me hear that. couple seconds and give me another one right 10 seconds and i want to another excerpt based off of my sweet embraceable you right beautiful that just came to my mind um, um, nights like this I wish raindrops will fall say that nights like this nights like this I wish I wish raindrops would fall raindrops would fall nights like this I wish raindrops would fall nights like this I wish raindrops would fall nights like this I wish rain raindrops would fall nights like this I wish raindrops would fall. that exact same passage on your instrument. Nights like this, I wish raindrops would fall. the concept that that's the entire concept um and i want everyone to keep in mind you may you take this and you make it your own you take this concept and you you apply it to whatever you're working on like that's my whole thing about teaching and music and 
we're all individuals. We all have our own visions, our own voice. We're all, it's all about individuality. And that's the beautiful thing about jazz music. It's all about individuality, but how it functions within the band, right? It's, it's such a powerful music, right? So you take this and make it your own, right? For instance, like I was saying earlier, you know, I don't want you to walk away thinking, okay, it's just about playing, you know, free melodies. No, you can really take this and put it under a microscope and say, okay, I'm going to, you know, take this concept and put it, you know, apply it to the changes of giant steps or apply it to, you know, I'm working on a harmonic minor sound in my ear. So I want to play free melodies only based off harmonic minor, right? So you really can make it your own. Um, it, it really is limitless. You know, you want to work on rhythm. So I'm going to take this free exercise. I'm going to, you know, make myself play five note phrases. Okay, that's cool. I'm going to make myself play this free improv, this excerpt, seven note phrases. So, so you can really put yourself in these mental boxes and really make it your own, you know, and that's the entire goal of this. Um, how much time we got left? Okay, let me get, uh, if we have one more student who would like to play and then I want to leave some room for question and answer. That's really, for me, the most important part because I want you all to walk away with some, again, some insight on what you're thinking about and what you're working on as well. So we got one more student who, who's willing to play. I'll play. <clears throat> Come on. Huh? <laughs> Let's get it, get it. All right, all right. Should I do the like free or? There we go. There we go. I didn't see, I didn't see you. I didn't see you. Okay, okay. Um, I start, start there. The exact same stuff. Hey, Donald. Hey, Donald. I, I, yeah, think I think you're, you're something's happening. Happen we, have, we have a feedback. Bag. Oh, really? Maybe, Maybe somebody, somebody not, not muting you. Sounds like there's multiple. There we go. Yeah, we get, we get. We so, get. so uh, check, check, check. Okay. Okay. Still, still in the headphones. Same, same concept. Your mind, mind is play, play shape, shape and, and chords. Chord. 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 Shape, shape, chords, chord. melody, melody that comes to your mind, right? Right. Take it away. Take it away. Can you hear this? Yeah, yeah. Exact same concept, but you can only play dominant seven sharp five chords, right? I want you to, you have the freedom to play whatever direction, whatever shapes, and, but you, you're in this mental box of only playing dominant seven sharp five. That sound, that tonality, right? See what type of shapes and contours and melodies you can create while putting yourself in that mental box. And now you're also working on exclusively this sound, right? Take it away.
Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do one more, and then I want to get some questions from everyone. Right? Right hand only, right? No, no, no four, six, four, six, four, four, six, four, four, You can only play, you're putting yourself in the mental box of playing five note phrases at a time, right? Take it away. you to everyone who played y'all sound good man so i've been doing like these type of zoom master classes you know most most of the you know the shutdown the pandemic and especially the last couple of months this has been one of the more enjoyable ones man y'all sound beautiful thank you for playing um yeah we've got a few minutes left i just want to get you know some questions from everyone like i said i want you to walk away with some insight on what you're working on i want to know you know i want to know what you're working on what you're listening to um, anything that I can assist you with? Actually, I have a, I have a personal question for you. Uh huh. Um, how much time did you take between your undergrad degree and then going back for your uh, master's? Because right now I just graduated in May and I was just talking to Corcoran Holt um, for my lesson Tuesday. And he was like, you know, if you're trying to go for a master's, check out like Queens College um, in New York. But um, my question would be like, how much time would you say is like, cool to take between like undergrad and masters and like what is the best use of that time yeah great question so it really boils down to just like knowing yourself like so for me i already knew if i take some time off i'm not going back to school like if i take any time off in between the degrees i'm gonna shed and start working and i'm not going to go back to school so i i just did it straight through i did four years and then you know, like a semester off and then did two years. Just so I was done with school in, in you know, six and a half years. But I, you know, I, I planned that. And I knew if I took a break, I wouldn't want to go back. But, you know, again, it's about you just kind of knowing, you know, yourself. Um, honestly, man, you know, if you do decide to take some time off, this school will always be there. I tell all my students, like, there's no, there's no rush to, to go to school. It will always be there. If you want to take some time off and study, listen to records, go work and, you know, really get your craft together before you go to school, I would say, you know, do that. Um, but to answer your question, I didn't take much time off. I took a semester and just went straight through because I knew that if I took more than that, I wouldn't want to go back. You know, For me, school, you have to be in a certain mind frame. Like if I had to go back to school right now, it would, it would take me time to readjust while I was already in the mind frame of being in school, I wanted to just knock it out. So, you know, that was my thinking. Um, what are you, how are you feeling about it? I'm curious. What do you, what you think? Do you want to um, take time off or you want to just knock it I out? Think, I think at that moment, like your kind of mindset of just like taking that one semester off, um, I'm kind of on that camp. Um, yeah. Because I know if, if I do, like you said, take a bunch of time off, I'm end up getting gigs or touring and I'm like, all right, cool. I don't yeah. want to go back to school, but just that that mental break of being like okay i finally got the undergrad like do i want to like immediately like go straight back in and go get the masters or like do i want to take a little time to like you said like shed check out some records um yeah so again i'm still kind of on the fence yeah. about it but definitely that mindset is kind of like maybe take a little time off and then go get it back while i still have the the mindset to go get the degree 
Absolutely. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, even if it's long, if you, even if it's two semesters, that, that break, it really is important. You coming from four years of being a student, you know, that break, that mental break celebration, a little woosah, it is important. So, um, yeah, I would, I would recommend, you know, taking a, a semester, maybe two, but if you do plan on getting that master's, just, just knock it out. And then when you're done, you're done, you know? For sure. For sure. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Great question, man. Beautiful sound. You already know, man. Keep doing what you're doing. You sound good. Anybody else? I have a question. Yeah, what's up? I, I want to ask you, what advice do you have for artists that want to live off of their craft and not just in jazz, but in any genre? Yeah. Man, that's a, that's a deep question. That's a great question. Um, that goes to many levels, man. It's like, it's a spiritual thing. It's a believing in yourself thing. It's a, uh, you know, seeing what you want and just going for that, not listening to the clutter and the distractions around you, not listening to what society tells you to do. Like it really is that journey you're talking about. It's a, you know, it can be a tough journey, but it's rewarding because it's nothing better than waking up doing what you love to do for a living. Like there's nothing, I don't care what it is, nothing better than that. You don't have to wake up and go clock in and work for someone else. You wake up and you work on your art and it's so fulfilling, right? So my advice would be do it, just do it and be serious about it. Really spend some time with yourself to figure out what resonates with you and and, and just envision those things and, and do it, man. Be serious. I was literally just talking to a friend about this. The seriousness that these, the older cats, they have about their music. Not even just music, just the, their craft. Like, the older generations of artists all across the board. Not just in music, actors. And the ser Denzel Washington just came to my mind. Just the, the seriousness that these cats had about their craft. Like, we have to adopt that, that mindset and, you know, just do it, man. Um, and I always tell, you know, my students as well there is no shame in if we have to go get a little side gig but in doing that the key to that is taking the funds from that side gig and pouring it into what we truly want to do so that side gig that fedex job that cafe job whatever it may be that's just a means to help us pour into our true art you know so that's that's my my advice man just do it like you seem like the type of cat who, you know, you know what you want to do. You're serious about your music. I say, go for it, man. We, we only live this lifetime once and we want to do what makes us happy. man. We want to, we want to wake up happy, you know, even if it's with less money, but I still get to, you know, create, I'm, I'm happy with that. And not to say that artists don't make money. There's lots of artists making millions of dollars, but um, yeah, that's, that's my advice, man. Do it and, and keep that seriousness about it. Yeah, great question. Yeah, any anyone else? I have a question. Oh, oh you go first. You got it. Okay. Um, mine's a little bit more of a logistical question, mm -hmm. uh, involving uh, making albums, uh, records, and a little bit more so like I guess a long term question: How do you make your albums relevant on in a particular scene? that you're trying to get into? How do you make it relevant rather than just, oh, another record that no one ever, that no one knows about, hears about, cares about, touches, even if it's good shit, you know? Mm -hmm. Man, that's a tough one too, man, because we live in a day where, man, I read an article not too long ago, like literally every single day, millions of songs are released. Or so, it was something stupid, like uh, there are a lot of songs being released every single day, so it's easy for you know, our music to get washed up in everything that's happening. Um, and it, it really is kind of connected to my last answer. First of all, just believing in your shit, like believing in your music. And ultimately you want to be doing it for self-fulfilling, right? My belief is when you pour music and pour yourself, your energy, like your intentions into your art, into your music, it's going to resonate with people because it's real. It's something that's like, it's a part of you. It's going to resonate with the people that it's supposed to resonate with, right? 
So for me, that's at the base of everything. But I mean, little things you can't, you know, that you can do if there's a certain scene you're trying to get into, reach out to those musicians, you know, try to hang with people in that scene, you know, um, write a piece for someone in that scene, you know, contact, try to build a relationship with someone in that particular scene um, and kind of start from there. And in the, this music, man, in this scene, it really is about being around, like being in the circle of the people that you want to rub elbows with. So, you know, reach out to those cats, let them know, like, I love your music. Uh, you know, I, I, here's a tune I wrote for you, or here's something that's influenced by you and just kind of surround yourself by the cats in that scene, you know? Um, yeah, that's what I, I would recommend, my kind of the starting place. But it really does boil it down to you believing in your your music, man. Like, you got to pour into your shit and it becomes something real and people will feel like, oh, this is this is real art. People will, it will resonate with people, you know? Great question, bro. Yeah, we got time for a couple more. Anyone else? I have a question myself. Yeah. So, uh, before any recording session, gigs, or whatever uh, performance, whether it's something that you lead or you set up, you booked, or whether you're under someone, like there's a leader that tells you what to do, tells you like uh, what tunes to play or whatever, whatever guidelines. Let's say like if a gig is focused on like uh swing instead of bebop mm -hmm. uh and what in what ways do you go about preparing for situations to where it's like you're really it's a it's a professional job and it's it's an artistic professional job that that it, as far as like um getting prepared getting prepared to to play to play uh anything you know just mm -hmm. just just play in general because for me personally it's um a lot of a lot of things go through my head whenever i'm going to the bandstand because it's a it's it's you know, like a one-time thing and like anything you do it you can't really uh go back and fix it it's there mm -hmm. yeah that's uh that last point you made is something, uh, it's, it's powerful. Um, it is something that I, I have to learn to deal with as well. I'll get back to the beginning part of your question, but you, you kind of struck onto something that is, is goal. Being able to, when you're on the stage, when you're in the moment, and this happens to me all the time, having the ability to leave what happened on the stage on the stage, right? Like, once the music is out out there into the universe, it's, it's already out there, right? And I remember going through a time where, because we're so critical of ourselves, we all are, right? We're our own worst critic. You know, I'll be on a gig and I make a mistake or play a note that I didn't want to play on the first song. And here it is, song four, and I'm still thinking about that note from the first song, right? I had to cut that quick, right? Because it takes you out of the moment, right? So once it's out there, man, you learn how to just... You know, it's out there. Once the music is out there, it's out there, you know, you know. Um, and like Miles said, man, there is no, there is no wrong, you know, man. there is no mistake. You know? Great drummer, man, Marvin Boogaloo Smith. Uh, I had the opportunity to study with him. He says, like, when he makes a mistake, it's a part of the music. Like, he makes his mistakes a part of the music. So that just kind of came to mind when you said that. But to answer your first part of the question, I think I understand what, you, what you're asking uh, for instance, if you're preparing for a, a specific gig kind of centered around the swing era, um, and I've been in that situation for, before, you know, what I do is really just try to listen to music from that era and put myself in that space, you know, say if I have a gig on, on, on a Friday or a Saturday night, you know, that Tuesday, I'm starting to listen to almost exclusively music from that era just to get that, you know, in me get that sound in me right so that I'm, I'm prepared you know for the performance so um that's something that i do i'm not sure if i'm answering your question exactly but um just being prepared as possible and those are the different hats we have to wear as as musicians as well i always tell my students 
we have to be well-rounded musicians, well-rounded individuals, especially if we want to work. Some of us are lucky enough to get to a point where we can only play our, our music. We can only play our shit, which is, that's a blessing. But a lot of us, we have to, okay, I just got called for this salsa gig. Shit, pays 300 bucks. Cool, I can do it. I got paid for the swing gig, it pays 500, big band. Cool, I can do it. So we need to be able to put on these different hats and put ourselves musically in these spaces. And for me, like literally listening, putting myself in that space before the concert helps me, you know, get to that space. So that's a great question, man. Great question. Yeah, that that helps a lot too, because uh, because uh, we listen to so much, like us, a lot of us are from New Orleans too. So it's like you you got you got um, you go on like Bourbon Street. You got a lot of like the uh, the pop music that people come to to the city for. Then you go to Frenchman. Then you got um, you got a lot. You got the jazz. You got a lot of uh, just. You got a, got a lot of people just playing on the street and everything. You, yeah. you got everything just going on at once. Uh-huh. So it's just like it's it could be a challenge to really balance it. But that's like from what I've received from you is that to kind of like get in that like mind space and that head space so that you're like so you know you're gonna know what you play. Absolutely. Gotcha. That's it. That's it. You know and. and then we talk about the internet man that's so we're being bombarded by music there's so much all day every day so really taking you know two or three days okay i've got this gig saturday wednesday night i'm going to lock in and listen to only music from this era right but try my best to really focus in and that that alone is going to get you in the space of that gig you know and also even when i compose man sometimes i'll try to get in a space where i'm not really like listening to a bunch of music because I want to just listen to my music and, you know, get into my vibe. So that's the time maybe I'm reading, I'm listening to podcasts or lectures and trying not to hear a lot of different people's music because we are, we're sponges. Naturally, humans, we, we soak in the things that are around us subconsciously. So it is, there's magic to being able to really, you know, tunnel vision in on one thing you're, you're focusing on. So great question. Great question, y'all. Marquise, I don't know. You know, we, we're a little bit, a few minutes over. Okay. I, I don't know if you want to take one more or we can wrap it here. If any, how you feeling? Yeah, I've definitely got time for one more. Yeah. Okay. Anybody got one last question? Yeah, I've got a question. Okay. Uh, okay. Did you always know that you wanted to do music as your career? Or was there anything, like, was there ever anything else you wanted to do also? Yeah, great question, man. So, <clears throat> man, I... I was fortunate enough. I fell in love with this really young. I said earlier, I joined band in fourth grade, uh, drum set, and I switched to the trumpet in fifth grade. And I was fortunate enough to just have mentors around me. Again, shout out to Diane Ellis, my elementary school director. She was the first person who showed me, oh, you can have a beautiful life playing your instrument and, and teaching and just doing what you love. She's Even to this day, she's such a lively woman. Um, so for me, I kind of did. Yeah. I knew for a long time I wanted to do something with music, like performing. And also I had that passion for teaching. Shout out to my mentors again, they ingrained the importance of being able to perform, but also being able to educate, being able to pass down, you know, um, pass down this information. So to answer your question, yes, at a young age, I knew that I wanted to, you know, perform music and teach music so I kind of went I went tunnel vision and focused on that but funny thing man my buddy asked me recently actually a female friend of mine um like if you couldn't play music what would you do like if you couldn't play music what would you do and for me it's just about being able to create like the beauty of music is we're able to create we're able to compose we're able to play and create something that did not exist before so if I couldn't play music, I would want to do something where I can create, you know, um, that's a little sidestep. But to answer your question, yeah, I was fortunate enough to fall in love with this really early. And, you know, I told myself, OK, cool, I'm going to I'm going to do this and I'm continuing to do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful, man. Great questions, you guys. And all y'all sounded great. You can um definitely they can they can link with you and 
on on Instagram and all the other socials and yeah, I'll put my email in the chat too. Y'all hit me up anytime. All right. Anytime. There you go, man. Everyone, y'all sound great. Like I said, this was a more enjoyable Zoom.